morning. A special welcome to any visitors. Please make yourself known to any member of the welcome group and sign our visitor's book at the front door. As there's no new sheet during the summer months, the intimations are displayed on the screen. Intruder alarms have recently been installed. With all key holders, please contact Jeanette Black for details. Please pray for John Smith, Ward 14, Wisha General Hospital, and Dora Brandt, Ward 1, Monklands Hospital. There is a tea bar in the large hall after this morning service. Join us for further fellowship. Thanks to Andrew Stephen for deputising at the keyboard this morning while Eric's on holiday. The Reverend Derek Hughes is on holiday for the next two weeks. For any pastoral requirements during this period, contact me, Crawford Moffat, in the first instance. It gives me great pleasure once again to welcome the Reverend Ian Mackenzie to lead our worship this morning. Ian is a member of our congregation and has recently retired from full-time ministry. He tells me he keeps active bowling and hill walking. His wife Mary, president of our guild, also keeps him busy with speaking engagements and household chores. Ian, may God bless blessings be on you as you lead our worship this morning. Thank you very much indeed. I didn't know I was going to get my life story to begin with. <laughs> uh, but uh, we're, we're very glad indeed to, to be with you and to join with you in worship this morning. As we begin our worship, we Prepare our hearts, and the opening prayer is printed. Lord Jesus, our Savior and role model, you put your faith in disciples to carry the torch that is your message to bring light to others. Come to us now, we pray. Touch our hearts so that we may dance before you in our inner being and spread the wonder of your love. Amen. And from the Psalms. Lord, what are human beings that you care for them, mere mortals that you think of them? They are like a breath. Their days are like a fleeting shadow. Yet, I will sing a new song to you, my God. On the ten-stringed lyre, I will make music to you. And so we indeed make music to the Lord as we open our worship and praise and sing the hymn, Rejoice, the Lord is King.
As the Father loved me, so have I loved you, said the Lord. Remain in my love. Let us worship him and bow our hearts before him. We gather, O Lord our God, with a great sense of overwhelming gratitude and praise. You are our Father, our great and everlasting God. We thank you for all that we enjoy day by day, for all that we are able to accomplish through your help and your guiding spirit. As we live in a world that we did not conceive, we appreciate its wealth of resources. We appreciate the wonder of its ecological balance. Indeed, yours are the minds that we have to make sense of its marvels. Yours are the gifts we use to tune in and align ourselves in all that we do to serve your purpose and your will. Down through history, you have revealed something of your nature and your purpose. Your amazing grace upon human beings. The words that have come through the prophets and the patriarchs from old times. The words from our blessed Lord and Jesus Christ on earth. And the great transforming message of the cross. We stand in the middle, therefore, of your continuing activity as you continue to speak to your world. Show us your love, Lord. Encircle us with your help and your grace. And we know that you want to bless our witness and our life. How wonderful it is that you remind us that we all stand forgiven through the cross. How good it is to know that you never leave us to flounder. We are never on our own. And you are with us in the reaching up of our hearts or our mind. How exciting it is to know that your spirit is renewing us and sending us out to be living witnesses where we are in a place and a niche that only we can fill. Oh, and we know that sometimes we have so much to learn. Often we are not very teachable. Sometimes we feel we are merely paddling in the shallows when you call us to launch out and get out into the ocean of your love. Often we run ahead and do the things and then realize you have not, we have not asked you and you have not blessed. We also know that we can give in quite easily when temptations come or feelings of anger rise within us to overwhelm us. But we also know that you are patient, Heavenly Father, with us all. And you recall us to your sure ways. You remind us of the true selves that we are dedicated to you. And so we reach out this morning to you, Father, as you are reaching out to us. You are saying, my children, you're mine. My love is surrounding you. Take my pardon that is offered freely to you. And go out clean, forgiven, restored, ready once again. And I'll work through you more than you can ever realize. And so your word to us is a wonderful word. Open our mouths in adoration. Open our hands to bless. And be with us as we offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord to whom with the Father and the Holy Spirit is given glory. And in his words, our Master's words, we pray and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. It, it is nice to see some of the youngest members with us, even carried in their arms, as you can see, and others as well, too. And this is for us. Um, this morning, 
Um, we think of something that has been happening for nearly for 70 days. It's been going round Britain, and if you see it on the screen there, you will see a chap called uh, Lord Coe um, sending out something that has been going round. And you know what it is, of course? It is the Olympic torch. The next slide shows us a picture of this torch. There it is. It's actually squashed up there, but it's, it's in nearly two and a half feet, I think. Um, quite a, it's quite a long, yes, yeah, quite a long thing. Uh, it's, it's made of um, two s s things, two s a out, an outside layer and an inside layer, and you know that there are 8,000 holes in it. 8,000 holes. So, so some of you who are older rem uh, remember some wee guys that used to put holes in tea bags. Do you remember? The 3,000 perforations in it. Uh, well, in the, in the torch, there are 8,000. And do you know why there are 8,000 holes? Yes? Because these are the numbers of people who are carrying the torch. A hole for every single one is carrying the torch. And that's quite interesting indeed. And it will have traveled 8,000 miles. It's come from Greece and it's come right through to, it's going around Kent, I think, at the moment, and will arrive on the 27th this week uh, at London. And then it will be into the Olympic Stadium and the Great Cauldron will be lit from it. And it continues. It's um, the torch. 8,000 runners, 8,000 holes, 8,000 miles. But perhaps we should remember an even greater torch that has been going, not for 70 days. Because what happens at the end of the Olympic Games? What happens to the torch, the flame? It's actually put out, <laughs> yeah. That's the end of it. That's it. At the end of the Games, no more flame. But we have a torch and we have a, a flame and a gospel that is not going to be put out. Uh, it's going to go on and on. And you and I have the privilege, and every member of it here this morning, no matter how young or no matter how old, uh, to carry this torch, the torch of the message of, of Jesus and his love and his gospel. And it brings light to the world, and the world desperately needs the light of the knowledge of the love of God. And so, hold up the torch and keep it going as we sing our next hymn, which is Colors of Day. So light up the flame and let it flame burn.
Uh, good to see you. You've got all the equipment anyway there. I think you've got for every eventuality. <laughs> uh, thank you. Now we're going to read in the Word of God in John's Gospel, chapter 17. We're dipping into a part of Jesus' prayer, a great prayer before the cross, in which he prays to his Father, telling him that the work is, on earth is done, and praying for his disciples that they'll be protected. And then he goes on in verse 20 to pray beyond them, down through the years. I pray, said our Lord, not only for them, that's the disciples, but also for those who believe in me because of their message. I pray that they may all be one, Father. May they be one in us, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they be one so that the world will believe that you sent me. I gave them the same glory you gave me, so that they may be one just as you and I are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be completely one, in order that the world may know that you sent me and that you love them as you love me. Father, you have given them to me, and I want them to be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, the glory you gave me. For you loved me before the world was made. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you sent me. I made them you known to them, and I will continue to do so, in order that the love you have for me may be in them and so that I also may be in them. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word, and may he apply it to our hearts. Now we continue to sing this wonderful hymn of Charles Wesley, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
That was a good thing, wasn't it? The, in the stories of the Bible, the wonderful thing is not just that God spoke to folk long ago and they heard God speaking, God guiding, God calling them. But the wonderful thing is that when we read it, that in a very strange way, it applies to us today. Its teaching is applicable in all conditions of people, in all walks of life, and all situations, and indeed in all the centuries. In our time, when we, we miss out so much if we neglect the great stories from the Bible. I know that you've been looking over the past year at a hundred of the great stories as they've been in the E100, Essential 100 reading. Um, a wee boy came and said, from the, the, I know what the Bible stands for to his mom and dad. I know what the Bible stands for. And he said, wait a minute, what is it? What are you trying to say? It says it stands for basic information before leaving earth. And in a way, that's not a bad definition of the Bible. Basic information before leaving earth. Well, in the Bible, a wonderful thing is that we can recognize God speaking to us. God calling us. And when we read, sometimes the words can stand out, can hit us, um, and uh, become alive. Again, the older ones among us, and I include myself, can remember the picture of the HMV label. Do you remember HMV? What was the picture? The wee dog, yes, and the dog was in front of the big horn of the gramophone, and the gramophone horn, and the dog was not just looking. He, his tail was going, his eyes were, had lit up, his ears were pricked. Why? Because he had heard his master's voice coming through the horn. He couldn't see the master. He looked everywhere, looked inside the horn, but he couldn't see it, but he knew the master was there. He recognized the voice. And the wonderful thing is, when we begin to read some of the stories of this good book, the wonder is that we too can learn to recognize our master's voice, our Lord, our God whether it is in the words of Isaiah and the, and, the, um, and the prophets, whether it's about leaders like Moses and David and, J and Joshua, or the apostles, Peter and James and John, the words can indeed be God speaking to us. Now, in the passage we set this morning, we listen to our Lord Jesus talking to his Father, and we have indeed, as it were, overhearing Jesus last among the last words on earth and his great concern, his concern for his immediate disciples, and then going on in verse 20, down through the ages. He has just said that he is completing his mission and asked God to glorify his, him as he had glory before he came. He prays for the apostles' safety and dedication to the mission. And then he turns, and verse 20, his concern is for all believers. It's very interesting. Jesus, two concerns before he left earth, just as he's about to go to the cross. We think these words could have been spoken in the upper room or something like that, before he went down to Gethsemane and the cross. His immediate concern for the 11 disciples and then many others down through the years who would accept his message. And so it is marvelous to think that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had us here, yes, 2,000 years later, us here in his heart, as it were, he was looking down through the centuries and seeing all those who believed in the apostles' teaching. And that's us. We're in the ones who have believed the apostles' teaching. 
and he would focus on us. And in turn, we should become the continuing agents of his mission until his return. And that means in these verses, Jesus is speaking about us and indeed is scrutinizing us in front of his Father. All of us here and reminding us what God wants of us, what he wants of us, and from us. And so he wants us to remember two things as far as the passage tells us. And we'd better not miss the, the message as it were because this was among the last great concern of our Lord's life. And his great concerns as in the long line of faith, we need to know where our energy to live comes from and what God wants us of all, all of us as Christians. I pray Verse 20, for all those believing in me through the apostles' preaching. And what is Christ's concern? That we have economic prosperity? <laughs> no. That we have a long life? No, not even that. That we have lots of comforts? <laughs> no way. That they may be one in me as you and I are one. To live in such close union that nothing that the earth throws at us, nothing that the evil one throws at us, can knock us off in our walk with him. That we may experience his love, an indestructible love. Death couldn't destroy it. Evil couldn't destroy it. And he wants us to experience the same love and to be with him. So, first of his two concerns. Two concerns. One, Christian unity, that they may all be one, verse 21 in John chapter 17. He doesn't want us to lose our corporate sense of identity, of belonging to him. Indeed, we already used it this morning when we used his prayer, the Lord's Prayer. The very first words of the prayer, our Father, not my Father and your Father, our, we are literally drawing a circle the great circle, that they may be one. And the Holy Spirit is able to preserve that unity of the Spirit in a bond of peace. Did our Lord foresee all the squabbles that mankind would get into when he said, when he said these words, that they may all be one? The folks, us versus them, Protestant versus Catholic, Christian versus Muslim, Muslim versus Hindu, and so on, down through the ages. We are in, they are in error. Remember, even the disciples got into that job of, uh, of uh, uh, thinking, uh, who is the greatest, they said. And maybe one said, oh, but I'm the greatest. I was called for, I'm the greatest. And our Lord came and he took the towel and put it round his, uh, round his middle and knelt at their feet and washed their dusty feet. Look, he said, you want to know who's the greatest? This is greatness. True greatness is service. Service. And so it is in this world that people think of power and they want power. There are indeed two forms of power. When I was in Mary Hill, I can recall a chap staggering along, and I've used the word advisedly because I think he had one or two too many down Maryhill Road. And he was flexing his muscles and saying, I feel so strong I could knock a hoose down. That's one kind of power, the power to destroy, the power to break. I think of another power, a lady, a single mother, who was saying, I don't feel strong, but I will do everything in my power. I will sacrifice anything for my family. And that's another kind of power. The power to break down a house and the power to build up a home. These are two different kinds of powers. And when we think of the world of today, there is a danger in the a kind of virtual reality world and we see this sadly in America, in Aurora, where this chap has gone amok, um, dressing up even in, uh, to be the Joker in this new uh, film, the screening of the Black Knight Rider. 
the danger of pow and splat and whoosh types of power, the power that you can use in the computer games. And the danger is that you imagine real power is zapping and eliminating and destroying at a stroke with an instrument of destruction in your hand, that that is power. It seems exciting. It maybe gives the illusion of power. Maybe you get a buzz when you win and destroy your opponents. But it's an illusion. It's unreal. And it's very negative. It cannot build relationships. And it puts you out of sympathy with the feelings of others. And that's a danger in the virtual reality world. True power is a power to heal, to build, to belong, to forgive, to integrate. And that's the power that God gives the power for you and me, the power that made this world and all that is in it, wants to save the world. I pray for these future believers, said Jesus, that they may know the oneness of our unity, Father. You and me and I and you, may they know that kind of oneness. There is a power, the power, saving power, the power to bring us into a new relationship and keep us in a relationship with God by forgiveness and by peace. The power to bring people together and to help them in the power of love. The power to reflect God's nature so that others might see it and know the harmony that can do in coming. Yes, to err is human and perhaps also to divide and to disintegrate is human. But to unite and to integrate and to forgive is divine. Now, look, it's important to notice that Jesus is not saying that we all should say exactly the same things and agree in every single thing in life. We should not do all the same list of, of belief statements and that we never take a different point of view and we never take a different perspective. He's not saying that. Uh, I can recall Ruth Graham once saying, that if a husband and wife agree on every single issue and they never ever disagree, then one of them, she says, is redundant. You don't need the other. But of course, we do take different viewpoints. And we, but the important thing is that we love one another, that we are united in that love, family love. And the father may look, or the mother may look at their child, and the child is doing anything but being nice, and they're doing almost the opposite of all that they want them to do. And you almost say, I love my child, and then you have to grit your teeth and say, I love my child, even although you would want to belt them. Love, true love, doesn't like to see them doing the opposite. It's not a feeling. It is indeed a commitment to act for good, and never for evil. And that's true love. And so in showing that love that binds us and holds us as blood-bought children, family members, we are not only showing God's likeness of his nature, but we are exercising the power of witness so that the world may see that God has sent him. The new commandment, no wonder Jesus called it that, love one another, Love one another and be one with the oneness that Christ had with his Father. Love one another and be one with the oneness of heralds that have the same message of love going out in the world. Love with the oneness that conveys God's name worthily to the world. For I think it is very sad when people are using the great sacred names, Allah or God, to use and to do destroying things and to do terrible things with bombs. What a terrible thing. One that commends God's name worthily. And that's the, the, the one thing that Jesus said. He said something else though. And he went on to say, not only our concern for Christian unity, but this next prayer he says is for future believers that we look forward to see Christ's glory where he is and that we too may share his glory. So his concern is not only for Christian unity, but for our Christian destiny. I can remember my mum speaking of a time when she visited a church in Inverness with her friend, our neighbor across the road. And uh, they came back from the service 
And my mum said that they, as they were going out from the church, the minister had shaken hands with them all at the door. Uh, and he had said to my mum and this friend, I says, it's a great place we're going to home, home to, isn't it? And the friend turned to my mum and said, I don't know if he knows anything about our home. We're just going home for a cup of tea. You know, and she obviously hadn't got the message that he was referring to the great home above. And she hadn't even been on that kind of wavelength. Uh, but the, so she had a wee smile as she, was, as she laughed uh, about the going home. But indeed, that's what Jesus is speaking of here. That they may see me in my glory. That they may see, be with Christ in his glory and that they will therefore fulfill their eternal destiny, verse 24. So here's why Christ prayed this wonderful prayer just before the cross, that we should know all that Jesus has done for us, that we should know all that he wants from us, and the love that he has showered upon us, and knowing that, that we should go out to share it, and be on our road to glory, and when we get home, what a wonderful day that will be. So from the start of each day, we need to remind ourselves that Christ is with us. He is the hope of glory. And we need faith every moment of our lives. Not just faith when we start the journey, but even more so on the road of the journey, we need to trust and to follow him. The unity formed by Jesus is one that takes us throughout our life. We need to remind ourselves as to whose we are and whom we serve. Whose motto is that? Whose we are and whom we serve? The guild, yes, and a great motto it is. We need indeed to know that his death, it works for us. If it doesn't end here, indeed it is a life that goes on and on through here and right through to hereafter. It continues daily as we draw resources from him. The love he gives, the power he gives, the assurance he gives helps us and forges that great chain of faith that takes us in one with all those who have gone on before us and one with those who will go after us. The love of Christ that we can experience on earth is Christ with us. He is the one who enables us to be Christians, to be the body of Christ and to keep us steady looking forward to that great goal, just as the Olympic athletes will look forward to reaching the tape. God's message to us this morning, therefore, comes to challenge all our divisions and our differences. There are things that don't matter, or they matter less than Christ with us. It encourages us to show that central unity of, in Christ, in God, in love, and in the gospel mission. Outward things don't really matter. Our cultural divisions don't matter. Our age doesn't matter. They are not unbridgeable chasms. Alternative lifestyles, different outlooks in human sexuality, how we relate to one another in society, arguments over where life begins and what we, we think, think of in the genetic modification of the pieces of the human genome. All these may not be answered fully. We are only human and our understanding is always partial at best. It is limited. But nothing can destroy the things that we do share. Joined to Christ, we are one with him. Forgiven, we come to him on the basis of the cross. Every one of us. Serving as sisters and brothers of the one Lord, we have a witness, a gospel witness. Working for the one kingdom. And these provide the unity the glue that cannot be undone. Somebody once said, to live above with those we love, that surely will be glory. To live below with those we know, well, that's another story. But we've got to live with those below, for that's indeed the great uh, key and so many things that cluster together and impact our life on earth. Life has become so complicated, so fragmented. It is important to see the great truth that God's love keeps us on the one road. And so Christ's prayer, let's remember it this week, 
that they may all be one, that we may realize our unity in him, that we may all realize our destiny, the great glory, and that we will let him work in us and through us this week, that they may all be one. What a wonderful prayer. And he is able to do it if you let him. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word to us all. Now we give to God our offerings and tithes. Dear Father, thank you for all the loving gifts you give to us and the love that comes from your fatherly heart. We give back these gifts for your mission of spreading your gospel in the world. And we ask 
not only that you would receive these gifts, but us too to play our part in the mission. And as you continue your mission, Lord, we would direct our prayers for your work in the world, for your purpose of calling people into the service of their lives. We would pray for the church, the body of Christ throughout the world, for you promised to bring to full fullness the work that your grace began. And so we pray for elders and leaders and ministers and those members of, who are involved in the work, wherever they are, whether there's a large group or whether they're small, we thank you that we're one in him communicating the good news of our Lord. Touch, O oh Lord, and help people to address the challenge of communicating the gospel in ways that can touch dead belief or unbelief. And so we pray for wisdom and insight into these changing days that you will help us in all the addressing the intractable difficulties and the divisive issues, both morally and spiritually. Bring us nearer to your mind, Lord, and unite us in honesty, in faith, and in common action. Lord, we pray for the nations of the world and especially for those in political roles of leadership, for those in government, locally, nationally, and in those who have a wider responsibility in the United Nations, in humanitarian agencies, those who work tirelessly for the greater good of peoples, the work for just government, for fair laws, for compassion for the underprivileged. Lord, give to them that divine love that can minister to beyond the barriers that people put up your great love with courage and with patience. Lord, we pray for all with a mission to care. We pray for our health institutions, our care homes, medical and counseling professionals. We pray for those in emergency services who go out in all situations of danger and need. We pray also for service personnel in our forces, the Army, the Royal Navy, and the Royal Air Force, and all who work si alongside local peoples in many lands, and in particular the continuing dangerous mission in Afghanistan. Guide, inspire, and protect all who seek to diffuse tensions and strengthen local leadership and work for peace. Lord, hear our prayer. And we do remember with thanksgiving our sovereign Queen Elizabeth, our Queen, in this her special jubilee year. And we thank you for our faith, her commitment, and our grace, all the years of these public service for our nation. And lastly, Lord, we remember in our prayers people who are in special need, like John and Dora mentioned earlier. We ask your blessing. We remember those who are anxiously awaiting results of tests, for those who are waiting for a new job, who have had results of exams, those who are starting a new life. Lord, be with them and guide them. And especially we remember those who are lonely or those who feel suicidal. Send helpers to help and to give a listening ear. And yes, Lord, use even us as your messengers of care. For every one of this morning here, send us out with a renewed determination to let you work in us, to recognize the King of the world, and to show the love that Jesus showed. Lord, hear our prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our last hymn, and the number is actually 511 for those who are using the hymn book. Your hand, O God, has guided your flock from age to age. One church, one faith, one Lord.
now go out in peace and love to serve the Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon us all, now and forevermore.